let's just think about the writing process now in terms of getting practical. And <clears throat> I think there are, there are five main stages that we need to think about. We'll go through, through each of these quite quickly, one by one. So first, setting the brief, setting the whole thing up, uh, deciding on the parameters, doing the research. It's very seldom that we can write something completely off the top of our heads. We'll need to do some work to, to do it effectively. Planning the structure of the piece, so it's got a good logical flow. Uh, then those three things all precede the writing of the article itself. And then most importantly at the end, rewriting the article. Because the first draft will never be the one that gets published or that you even put up on your blog. It'll need some further pruning and working on it. So let's just think about each of those uh, together. And the first question in setting the brief is, what is your message? Uh, write down in 10 words containing a verb what your message is. And I hope most of you brought along pieces that you've written to this seminar that you'll be able to have an opportunity to work on later and can ask these questions about. But if you cannot write down the key message of your piece, whether it is a book or a booklet or an article or whatever, in one sentence of maybe not 10 words, but certainly no more than 20, containing at least one verb, then uh, you can be pretty sure that your piece will not be coherent. Who's your audience? Because uh, that'll affect the way you write. What is the length? Is, it, is this a, a 500 or 600 word blog piece? Is it a uh, you know, a 3,000 word more in-depth piece? Is it a 10,000 word booklet? Is a, is a whole book? And then, uh, importantly, what's the deadline that you've got to meet? It may not be, if it's your own blog, it might not be any deadline at all. But most publications, you need to uh, be well ahead of time. So doing the research, and there are two main problems in this, is that is that people have this tendency, first of all, to use research as an excuse for not writing. And so you think, oh, I've just got to read a bit more stuff, a few more articles, another book or so on, and then I'll be the expert in the position to write my piece. And of course, the problem is that the research goes on and on and on, and you never have the courage or the discipline actually to draw lines, uh, or, or otherwise letting the research expand beyond the time available so that you create a crisis for yourself in re reaching the deadline later on. And, and the, the answer here, the key, is to research the brief and not the whole subject. So if you've got your, <clears throat> you've got your message of 10 to 20 words, including a verb, of, of, of what you want to put across, then that's the only thing that you should be researching, how you can bolster that. So you decide on your destination and you set a time limit. So is it um, Stephen Corby, is it with the, you know, one, of, one of the habits of highly effective people is that they start with the end in view. So you've got to know what your end point is and formulate the questions you want to answer and seek the answers to those specific questions. It, uh, you would be amazed at how little time it takes a, a really experienced journalist or someone who does a lot of media work to prepare to write you know, an 800 word journalistic piece or to appear uh, on a television interview and answer questions for five minutes. And it, it is because, well, they might know the subject, but uh, often they, they don't know the subject, but they know exactly how much stuff they need to read and what the time limit is and therefore can, can decide what you need to know. And uh, especially doing me media interviews is very much like this. So if someone rings you up and says, I want, uh, could you in an hour and a half speak on this subject? And you think, well, that's not something I know terribly much about necessarily, but I know in, in an hour's time, I will know enough to sound convincing in a three minute interview on the subject. And, and then you go away and you think, right, what can I really read and digest and, and put into my key bullet points within that time. That's all I'm going to research so that I've got enough to, to do the job, just enough to do the job. 
And then uh, where are you going to look? And it, 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 if there are pet subjects that you write on, then you're going to have your own files and notes. And you need to have a really good filing system, whether it's electronic or paper, to, to do that. <clears throat> the thing about a filing system is that it is a filing system, not a piling system. And, and a filing system is not about storage. It's about retrieval. And so the way it's got to work is that you need to very quickly be able to find exactly what you're looking for. Otherwise, it's, a, it's just simply not worth having at all. And of course, um, you know, your, your own books, uh, everyone has habits here. What, what I do when I read a book is I, I, um, as I go through, if it's my own book, then I'm underlining in pencil the, the key quotes. And then on the back page, I'll put a list of the page numbers as I go through and, and write, you know, there was a particularly good thing here and so on. Now, it, does that mean that I therefore know everything in the book when I finished it? No, not, not necessarily at all. But it does mean that when I come to write something on that subject, I can go back and very quickly find that the really the meat without ha being uh, feeling like I'm reading the book for the first time again. Of course, the internet has made it much easier for us to find things, but conference and sermon notes like this and if you, if you come to a conference like this, you, you'll hear lots of fantastic speakers who are experts in their areas. And if you go along and take good notes, then that can be the basis for years of giving talks. <laughs> in, in the future, uh, it's, it's most important. So know your avenues of inquiry and, of course, your own previous writing and talks. Uh, you know, I, I, it took me a while to learn this, but, but um, uh, many journalists... Uh, and you'll see this, if you go to the BBC website or something, you'll see an article that's been put up very quickly on a subject. And uh, if you go back, you'll find uh, something that was written a year ago or two years ago, and, and uh, virtually everything is there. And so they've just done very focused research, and they've produced something that looks very new, but actually it's used things that they've written before that other people have written before, but their readers haven't read before. So uh, number three is planning the structure. And the, the elements in a successful piece of journalistic writing, but I think it's true of books and, and booklets and, and things as well, blogs, is, is that you need three things. So the, the, there's the hook to grab people's attention, first of all, and get them listening to you. Then there's the argument which gives your points and maintains their interest throughout. And then the punch at the end, which makes them go on thinking. And the thing is, you want them bottom line here is you want them to read the whole piece effortlessly. You don't want them to speed read it, just catch the odd thing, and so on. And so if you're wanting to write persuasively, unless you're writing for a specialist journal or something, then don't follow these kind of specialist structures that uh, people have in medical journals. We used to talk about IMRAD, you know, introduction, methods, results, and discussion. Uh, and is how you write a journal. And of course, the way uh, people read journals, certainly the way doctors read journals, is that they, they open it up and look at the contents page. They identify three or four articles that they might be interested in. And then they turn to those articles. And usually, all they read is the abstract at the beginning and, and part of the conclusion. Most of it is not going to be read. So you, you want a, a very good piece of advice I had from a surgeon I worked with very early on, he's my boss, and he said, Peter, you've got, to, you've got to grasp this really important fact that journals are for writing, not for reading. Journals are for writing, not for reading. So they're, to, they're a place to get your publications so that you can then cite them in your CV, but don't expect anyone's going to read them, you see. But the point is we want people to read our stuff, and we want them to read all of it. And so we've got to write in a way that really engages people when they uh, do uh, read it. So uh, planning the structure, what, what is the hook? Well, it's um, six words to grab attention at the beginning. And uh, that's one thing you can do with your piece when you look at it later. Just read the first six words in isolation, highlight them, and, and ask yourself, what level of consciousness are people at at the time they get to the sixth of these, these words? Because you can kill a brilliant piece by having a poor introduction to them. And if you look at the way, uh, 
So go, go to a, a news website, say like the BBC, and read a news article, all the top stories, and you'll find they're constructed in a certain way. The headline gives the message in about six words. The first sentence sums up the whole article, and then the first four sentences give all the main points in the article. And there used to be a thing some of you will remember called CFAX before we had the internet, and you could, you could turn on your television and click on CFAX, and it would give you four sentences. And I, I realized uh, after a while that those four sentences were the first four sentences of the BBC article on their website that they'd just transposed, but they contained the whole message of the article. So the hook is to, to grab uh, attention. And then there's the argument, which needs both bones and flesh, so it's the it's the, the, the points that you want to make, maybe just three or four points, and something that illustrates each of those points. And each paragraph, starting with the key sentences, don't bury them in the middle of the paragraph. So someone should be able to scan an article that you've written and uh, pick up the main points in the thread of the argument by, by doing that, making every sentence count. And then the punch at the end is, yeah, they say your message in words they won't forget, or, or maybe a question to make them go on thinking. So you're grabbing them, you're taking them through the process, and then you're hitting them at the end with something that's going to make them go on thinking afterwards, after they've read your article or, or piece. To create a hook, you need to get your reader's attention. Now these are, these are book examples. It was a bright cold day in April and the clocks were striking 13. Where's that from? Come on. 1984, yeah, George Orwell. Mother died today, or maybe yesterday, I can't be sure. Uh, the clue is it should be in French. Camus. Yeah, Albert Camus, l'étranger, yeah. The stranger or the outsider, yeah. And it, they've got you, haven't they? I and mean, this is a book, but they've got you from the first, the first line of it. Um, this is the English buffs. It was a queer, sultry summer, the summer they electrocuted the Rosenbergs, and I didn't know what I was doing in New York. It's uh, the bell jar, Sylvia Plath. But, but you get the point, don't you? It, it's really worth expending time on your opening and your closing arguments. And, and when you're writing an article, it might be that those are the last two things you do that the bones of the argument are there first. And of course, it's much easier now that we have word processors because we can do things in, in different orders. The next step is actually uh, writing the first draft. So you, you've, you've spent a lot of time and effort preparing for this moment uh, straight away. And the key thing here in writing a first draft is, is really to be creative and not critical. And what I mean by that is that that all of us have creative faculties and critical faculties. And our creative faculties will, will run our imaginations off in various directions. And our critical faculties will be sitting over our creative faculties, criticizing them. And <clears throat> the key thing is to, is to just let it flow and don't worry too much about what is coming out when you're writing the first draft. It's going to be imperfect, and it should be imperfect. And if it's perfect, you're probably not being creative enough. So to remember that it is the first draft. And when you see a finished piece uh, written by an expert, you're seeing something that's probably been through a whole series of different edits. <clears throat> if ever you get the moment or the opportunity and you're in London, then it's, it's a good uh, use of time to visit the British Library. And the British Library is right next to St Pancras Station. And if you go into the British Library and up the main steps, then immediately on your left, there's a, a room called the Reading Room. And it's like a little museum of uh, historical pieces of writing and music and so on. And it's fascinating to go in there and you can read everything from the Magna Carta to the Codex, Alex and Dryness, New Testament scripts are there, old Qurans and so on. But also there are musical and written drafts and you'll find, you'll find uh, 
uh, drafts written by the Bronte sisters and, and uh, written by uh, Jane Austen or uh, pieces written by Handel, Handel's Messiah is there. And of course this is before, way, way centuries before um, the kind of technology that we have today. And so they did it all by hand. And what's amazing is you look at these novels that are so well known and they're all covered with crossings out all the way through. Sometimes whole pages are scribbled out and you know, lines and words are changed and, and so on. And th there are some drafts there of uh, songs written by the Beatles. And it's, they're, they're written on, the first drafts are written on uh, placemats and little scraps of paper or on a paper bag or something like that that just happened to be there at the time. And you can see the words of a song that you know so well, but you see that the original words were different and there's been things crossed out and changed. And this is how great artists and writers do it. Probably the most amazing to me was Handel's Messiah. We know he, he um, shut himself off for three weeks or something in the room and they pushed food under the door and, and he was just almost in a, like in a trance-like state uh, creating. But if you look at the script of Handel's Messiah, you'll see whole lines of it are, are crossed out. So the important thing is in your first draft to be creative and uh, just to let it flow. And uh, the three things, you need something for recording the words uh, that you might prefer just to write in pencil and paper. Uh, most people now will just type straight onto a word processor or you uh, maybe if your typing is not that good, you can use speech recognition software. I'm finding I, I, my typing is not nearly as good as it was 10 or 20 years ago. I can't spell simple words like the and 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 medical and Christian. I always get, spell them wrongly in the same way each time, which can be very frustrating given my, uh, the kind of work I'm doing. But uh, so I've found if I'm preaching sermons, for example, what, I, what I'll do, I'll, I'll do my research and set the brief and so on, and then I'll just dictate it, the whole thing, sentence by sentence into a word recognition software, and then, then I'll go back with the first draft and then rework it into what I want to do. So a means of recording the words, a plan, so you, you've got to know what you're doing, what the message you want to give is, and then peace and quiet. So you, you really do need to cut yourself off from all distractions, turn off your phone, put it in another room, uh, let the family know what the, where you're going to be. And, and uh, you want to write the whole thing if it's an article, preferably in one sitting, even if it's a longer, a shorter piece, or if, if it's something like a book, break it down into chapters. And, and thing. Writer's block. Um, which we all suffer from at times, it's when you just can't, you know, you sit there and you sit there and you sit there and you just can't think of what to write. And the, the important thing to, about writer's block is that to understand that it's because, if you have writer's block, it's because you're trying to write the perfect sentence. You're trying to write the perfect sentence. And in other words, you've got your critical faculties turned on, but not your creative faculties. So far better to write something that's okay, that you can come back and improve later. And as, as I mentioned earlier, often the conclusion and the, and the first sentence, or, or the opening, are the last things that you write for a piece, because you, you're putting your main argument together. And this is certainly the case in preaching. You're preaching a sermon, then you, you, you'll have your arguments and the points you want to make and your illustrative material, but often the last thing you'll write will be the hook, the introduction, the first three sentences you, you speak, which are going to move the congregation from their state of spiritual torpor into suddenly sitting up and uh, wanting to engage. And of course, it might have nothing to do with what you're going to say later on. Uh, hopefully, there'll be some kind of connection, but the whole point of the opening of a sermon or an article is to grab the listener or grab the writer. So uh, better to come back to it and uh, perfect the opening and the end later. So and then and then you put it away. Uh, I mean, you might have a very tight deadline. It's impossible to do that, but generally you, you're going to put it away and then come back to it with fresh eyes, maybe the next day or a week later or, or something depending on how tight your deadline is, and look at it again. And you'll see all sorts of things that you couldn't see the first time and ways of improving the piece that you've, you've got. 
and so uh, in the same way, it does, if you're writing something that's, you know, 1,200 words, it doesn't matter if you start off with 2,000 words. You're actually going to make it better and better by shortening it down. It's better to have too much material at the beginning than too little and be trying to, to pad it out. And you know, there's a famous quote, I've sent you a long letter because I didn't have time to write you a short one. And it, it takes a long time to write a really good letter to the editor that's going to hook them, make the argument, and leave them thinking at the end, for example. So uh, also, uh, find regular advisors. And there are lots of different advisors. You know, we all need help. I certainly had a lot of help in my development of, as, as a writer. So the, first of all, the expert advisor, the, the one who's going to you know, uh, correct your factual errors. The last thing we want is someone taking our piece and dissecting it and doing a fact check on it and uh, demonstrating to the world that we didn't do our research properly. So someone who really knows about the subject who can say to you, oh, you know, I think if you say this, it's not quite backed up by the facts. And then there's the nitpicking advisor, the, the people we love to hate, but these are people who have this wonderful gift of um, obsessionality where, and you might be like this yourself, I'm a bit like this myself, but where it really irritates you when there's an apostrophe in the wrong place or um, a word is spelt incorrectly, um, uh, particularly errors that are commonly made by, by people. So, and, and they may irritate you, but they will really help you. A nitpicking advisor, someone who can go through your piece and pick out all, all the misspellings and grammatical constructions that are wrong. And then there's a style advisor. Style is something we're going to talk about a lot more in this session. Style is all about uh, improving the readability of your piece. So you may have perfect grammar and no factual errors, but it's written in such a stodgy way that it, there's, there are huge obstacles to people getting through it and learning your message. And style is something we can always improve. Then the political correctness advisor. As a, as a New Zealander coming to Britain, uh, especially the southeast of Britain, uh, there were all sorts of things I didn't understand about the culture. And for the first few years I was there, I was forever offending people by saying things that I thought were, um, you know, true and necessary and occasionally kind as well, but in ways that, that were very unhelpful. And so to have a political correctness advisor who, who can read your piece and say, uh, you know, this is great, but do you realize this particular sentence is really going to wind up this constituency? Or is it really going to offend these people? And just by making this little tweak, you can avoid that offense, and then that will mean that when they read the article, they'll get the point you're trying to make and not go away just angry with you. <clears throat> and then uh, the warm fuzzy. So these are the people who, uh, it seems like whatever you write, they think it's absolutely wonderful. And they, and they come back and say, oh, this is just fantastic. Because we all need encouragement. But if we just have warm fuzzy advisors who make us feel good, then we're not going to be very effective communicators. We need all the rest. And you might be lucky and you'll find people who can um, do a number of these different things. But it's... It's, you know, as, as you progress, you'll, you know, we all get better and better at, at, at writing, and perhaps we need this kind of help less and less. But there'll, be, there'll be, always be occasions when you're writing something that's particularly sensitive or challenging or difficult, and you, you think, I really need more advice and help with this, and uh, this person can help me on, on whatever. So, and I've had people in all of these categories at various stages um, who I know I can can go to uh, to ask, and, and I'll get honest answers. Except from the warm, fuzzy ones, of course. They, they will just tell you you're wonderful, regardless of, of what it is. They'll say, this is the most wonderful thing I've read. Everyone needs to hear this, and so on. And then you go to your political correctness advisor, and he says, no, you'll just completely wind up half the people who read this because of the, the tone or the, or the phrase that you've used. 
And so the bottom line is, you know, expect to make many changes. Think about Handel, think about the Bronte sisters, think about uh, Lennon and McCartney writing their songs, that always what you're seeing is the finished product after the creativity and the rewriting that, that comes into doing the piece. So just to sum it all up, how, how do we write? Um, we, we have to know what our message is, we have to know what our audience is, uh, the level that we're writing, are we writing to general people in the pew or a specialist audience? Uh, how educated are they in this particular subject? Is this the first thing they will have ever read on it or are they people for whom this is bread and butter every day? <clears throat> With a title aim to attract, we'll come back to that, but we've talked about first lines and uh, we had some great headlines as well in the Ben Agency test. And then uh, always ask yourself, you know, what do I want them to do? So after they've read my piece, what do I want them to go away believing that they didn't believe before? And what do they, I want them to do as a result of those new beliefs? That may, may sound all very grandiose, but, but I think we should be asking that about every piece that we're reading if we're wanting to have influence. 